once read a sociologist who was doing a study of comparing a Western Insight Meditation Center with a Thai American temple. And she commented to one of the people at the center that she was surprised how the, the people at the Thai temple didn't practice much. They were there for being generous and being virtuous, but they didn't sit and meditate that much. Unfortunately, the person she was talking to said, well, wait a, wait a minute, maybe generosity and virtue are a practice. In other words, practice isn't just a matter of sitting with your eyes closed or doing walking meditation. It's something you can do all the time. As the John Mahabua once said, wherever there's mindfulness, there's the practice which means that you could be sitting here right now and not really practicing because you're not being mindful. At the same time, you could be out and doing things, engaged with other people. But if you're mindful, you are practicing. Now, this could lead to some misunderstandings. I know one in particular, someone who had actually studied with the Jamahabu and come back to the States, and one day in the context of an issue where people were complaining about the idea of doing body contemplation for fear that doing a week of body contemplation they'd go back to their, their partners and wouldn't be able to have a relationship. And then he told them, well, remember what the Buddha said, that whatever you do, do it mindfully. Which, given the context, was not the right thing to say. Mindfulness doesn't just mean being aware of the present moment, or having bare awareness or bare attention, or non-reactive awareness. Being non-reactive is not necessarily part of the practice, not always the practice. Sometimes you have to respond, and your awareness has to be very directed. In fact, that's what mindfulness is. It's directed awareness. Mindfulness is keeping something in mind. Like right now, you're meditating. You're keeping the breath in mind. You're keeping your meditation word in mind if you're using a meditation word. Remembering not to wander off. And remembering also, if you wander off, you come back. You can also remember what ways have worked in the past to get the mind to settle down. So if you come up with an obstacle, you can work your way around it. This involves three, three qualities, so mindfulness, alertness, and ardency. Each of them has to be right. Mindfulness is remembering basically what's skillful and what's not skillful. And you've either learned it from what you've heard or read or discovered on your own. And remembering also that you want to abandon what's unskillful and develop what's skillful. As for alertness, it's not just being aware of what's going on in the present moment. For it to be right alertness, it has to be focused on what you're doing and the results that are coming from what you're doing. And finally, ardency in order to be right means you're trying to do this well with your whole heart. This is your main focus. So the ability to keep in mind what's skillful and unskillful and to notice whether you're actually doing it or not. And if you're not doing it, making the effort so that you can do it. And if you are doing it, making the effort to keep doing it. All of this counts as the practice. And it's something you can do anywhere. You can be talking with other people. In fact, this is a really good way to practice. You keep asking yourself, what would be the skillful thing to say now? And then go ahead and do what that skillful thing would be. That's the question you should always bring. What's the skillful action here? What's the skillful action now? And action here, of course, meaning physical actions or your words or your thoughts. And then once you've framed it, the question in this way, see what answer comes up, and then try it out. And this is the way you 
perfect your skill and develop your skill, get practice in being skillful. By noticing when you carry through with what you thought was skillful, what are the results? And if they were as good as you thought they'd be, okay, remember that. If they weren't, remember that too and try to figure out a way to do it better the next time. This is what it means when a John Mahaboa says, okay, where there's mindfulness, there's the practice. All of these things together. So basically what you've got here is a combination of two of the five strengths. You've got persistence and you've got mindfulness. And the two of them together form the practice. They're fed by conviction, what keeps you going, because a lot of times when the skillful thing is one thing and what you would like to do is something else. Or the skillful thing seems like it's hopeless. In other words, you you know that no matter what you do, things are going to go poorly in this particular situation. Then you might feel inclined just to give up on trying to do the skillful thing. Or when you're sick, or when you're getting old, or when you're facing death, you might say, well, who cares? They've got to learn how to get past that. There's a great French phrase, which translated means, you don't need hope in order to undertake something good, and you don't need success in order to stick with it. What you need, of course, is conviction. And conviction here means being con convinced that the Buddha really did gain awakening. You're convinced not only that the Buddha gained awakening, but that the implications of his awakening have a direct bearing on what you're doing and saying and thinking at any time. Because after all, how did he gain awakening? It was through his actions. And what did he awaken to? Well, they're the three knowledges. He gained knowledge of his previous lifetimes, knowledge of how all beings in the universe, in the universe die and are reborn in line with their karma. And then finally, what kind of action takes us beyond aging, illness, and birth, aging, illness, and death? The knowledge that, again, is the result of our own actions. The Buddha was able to do it, and as he said, it was because of qualities that we can all develop. That we can reach the same awakening as well. But even before we're on the verge of awakening, his awakening has a direct bearing on what we're doing at any one moment. To begin with, the, the whole issue of rebirth. If you're reaching the end of your life and you feel that your life is going to end in nothingness, you're going to be less and less inclined to make any kind of effort at all. And even right now, the question always comes up when you do something, when you make an effort to do something that you think might be skillful but you know is going to be difficult, or just go against what your defilements are saying. The point that will make all the difference is, is it worth the effort? And the Buddha's awakening basically says, it's always worth the effort. I was reading recently someone saying that now with our modern worldview, the whole question of whether people survive death or don't survive death is totally irrelevant. You don't even have to ask the, ask the question. It's not worth answering. The only case in which it would not be worth answering would be in a world where nobody's doing any actions, where actions are not a gamble, where actions are not difficult. If everything were easy and just kind of s slipped along in, without anybody making any choices or having to overcome any difficulties, then the question of what happens as the result of our actions would be irrelevant. But here we are. Your actions have results. And the question is, how long do those results last, and how strong can they be? And the Buddha's answer is, in line with his second knowledge, is that the things you do now can have a long impact, not only in this lifetime, but or the next one, or, but also in lifetimes after that. So even in situations where it's really difficult, you're faced with starvation, you're faced with 
collapse of society, you would still be able to say to yourself, I'll do the skillful thing and stick with it, because you know that the, the actions you do will last beyond the collapse of society and will last beyond starvation. That gives you the strength to keep up the practice regardless. As for the third knowledge, as the Buddha said, it comes down to seeing how the mind is creating unnecessary suffering for itself and realizing that you don't have to do that. What this means is when you find yourself suffering, you always have to look back. Okay, what am I doing? What assumptions am I bringing to this situation that are making me suffer right now? And realize that those assumptions are not necessary. That there is something skillful you can do. There's a skillful way you can think right now where the mind is not burdening itself. So you look into where there's the craving, where there's the clinging, and what can be giving rise to that craving and clinging, what kind of clinging it might be. Are you clinging to sensual, sensual fantasies? Are you clinging to old habits and practices? Are you clinging to views that are causing you to suffer? Are you clinging to an idea of yourself that's causing you to suffer? These are things you can change. And making the effort to change those, like, that's the practice. This all comes under a John Mahabua statement that wherever there's mindfulness, there's the practice. Because mindfulness enables us to keep the Buddha's awakening in mind. His awakening is not just one event in human history, it's an event that reorders everything. The tradition says that at the moment of his awakening, the earth shaked. Not only the, the earth, but also the heavens were, were shaken. And what that means is that this is a signal event. It's the kind of event around which you can arrange your life. Even though it was a long time ago, its implications are very direct right here, right now. And that knowledge that wherever you are, whatever situation you're in, there's also always the skillful act in that situation. Now, it may mean that you have to give up some of your pleasures, some of your whatever you're attached to. And sometimes the skillful thing may be just, okay, we're going to have to die skillfully. We're all have, going to have to die at some point. So it doesn't matter when, it doesn't matter whether it comes early or comes late. What matters is how you do it. That's the perspective that you get from taking seriously the fact that the Buddha did gain awakening. So remember, even though there are times when you don't have much opportunity to sit with your eyes closed or much opportunity to do walking meditation, there's always the opportunity to practice. And always keep that question in mind. What is the skillful thing to do now? And informing that question with what you've learned, both in your own practice and what you've learned from the fact that the Buddha did gain awakening. It's conviction and that awakening that gives strength to your mindfulness and your alertness and your ardency and helps make them right mindfulness, right alertness, and right ardency. That's a practice you can do all the time.